Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to be here to share with you all about the NASA Frontier Development Lab and its partnership with uh, Google Cloud. Uh, so my name is Megan Ansdell. I'm a postdoctoral fellow um, at UC Berkeley in the astronomy department. Uh, my background is in astrophysics and planetary science. Um, and today I'm going to tell you about FDL. Um, I participated in FDL last year in 2018. Uh, so the NASA Frontier Development Lab is um, a public-private partnership between NASA and partners in industry that specialize in space and artificial intelligence. And the goal of NASA FDL is to create innovative solutions to problems that are of interest not just to NASA, but to humanity in general. So FDL has focused on problems like planetary defense, so trying to find asteroids that might be on a collision course with Earth uh, before they hit us so that we don't end up like the dinosaurs. Um, also looking at problems like space weather, so trying to track uh, flares on our sun so that we can better understand the impacts to satellites in orbit that we depend a lot on, like our GPS satellites. And the way this works is that uh, FDL puts on an eight-week research accelerator uh, down at the SETI Institute in Silicon Valley over the summer. And uh, the way it works is that there are these four-person teams. Uh, the teams are made up of two space science subject matter experts and two machine learning researchers. And they work very intensely together for these eight weeks uh, on a challenge that's been given to them. So this past year for FDL, there were five challenge areas. Uh, it was space resources, space weather, astrobiology, Earth observation, and exoplanets. And each one of these challenge areas was supported by one of our private partners. Um, and these, are, these private partners are really leaders uh, in commercial AI. So Google Cloud, of course, um, but also companies like KX, IBM, NVIDIA, um, and Intel. And we also had support from uh, some of the leaders in private space, so companies like Lockheed Martin um, and Space Resources. So this is the 2018 NASA FDL uh, cohort. Um, we're all smiling and looking fresh-faced because this is the beginning of the summer. Uh, we looked very much more tired at the end of it, but for good reasons. Um, so we were a very interdisciplinary and diverse group. Um, this is a very special group of people. Um, about 50% of us were based in the United States as researchers. The other 50% uh, were from around the world. A lot of us were PhDs, so some of us had PhDs in astrophysics. Um, others had PhDs in things like computer vision, uh, robotics. Um, it was a wide range. There are also people from industry that came from companies like Hyperloop and Apple, uh, Audi, just to name a few. Um, and it's really because of our partnerships with uh, companies like Google Cloud that we could all come together for the summer and work on these really exciting challenges uh, through this very unique program um, of NASA FDL. So we also had some pretty amazing data sets to work with. Uh, sometimes NASA gave us these data sets. Um, other times we had to generate the data sets using um, the wonderful compute uh, power tools uh, through, through companies like Google Cloud. Um, this particular data set was used by the space weather team this last year. Um, this is a real image of our sun taken by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, which is in Earth orbit right now. And it looks for um, activity on the sun so that we can better understand uh, the impact of that on Earth. So to analyze these data sets, we had access to a very diverse AI toolkit and just vast amounts of compute power, um, again, provided to us uh, by our private partners. Um, and I have to say, so I'm, I'm a scientist in academia, and this was truly amazing. We do not have access to, to resources like this normally. Um, and it was very eye-opening to see uh, what kind of science could be done in an incredibly short amount of time when you're given just the best resources uh, that are available. So today I'm going to talk to you about two of the challenges from last year's NASA FDL program that were made possible through this partnership with Google Cloud. So that is the exoplanet challenge um, and the astrobiology challenge. So I'll talk about the exoplanet challenge first, because that was a team that I was uh, fortunate enough to be on. So this is the exoplanet team. Um, so I was one of the uh, subject matter experts as a planetary scientist. Again, I'm at UC Berkeley. Hugh Osborne was the other planetary scientist. He's in Marseille. Um, and then the two uh, deep learning experts were Yanni Ioannou, who just graduated from the University of Cambridge with a PhD, uh, Michele Sastelli, who is a recovering astrophysicist and is now um, at the University of Adelaide uh, with their computer vision group. We had some great mentors, both on the science and machine learning side, um, and of course our compute resources were provided uh, by Google Cloud. Okay, so the challenge that we had 
was to increase the efficacy and yield of exoplanet transit classification with deep learning. So I'm going to break that down for you, and I'll start with the exoplanet side. So first of all, what is an exoplanet? Uh, so you know, everybody knows our solar system. There's the sun. The sun is a star. There are eight planets in orbit. No booze about Pluto not being a planet anymore? <laughs> all right, there are eight, but there you go. Um, so there are eight planets in orbit. And so an exoplanet is just a planet that's orbiting another star. There are 100 billion stars in our galaxy, and we can now say that, on average, every single one of them contains at least one exoplanet. Um, and that's pretty amazing that I can stand up here and say this today. So the first exoplanet was discovered in 1995. So exoplanet science is actually an incredibly new field um, in astrophysics. Um, and we now know that we, we've detected thousands of them, and we can start studying them as a population. We can start doing things like estimating you know, the frequency of Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. And one of the reasons why we can do that is because of the wonderful success of a particular method for detecting exoplanets, and that's called the transit method. That's what's being shown on the left here. So the transit method works by just taking advantage of the fact that if you see an exoplanet system at a particular orientation, when a planet goes in front of its host star, you see a drop in brightness of that host star. And that should be a periodic thing. Every time the planet goes around, you should see a drop in brightness. So we don't actually resolve what's being shown on the far left there. We don't actually see the star and the planet. What we do is what's on the, on the, in the middle there. Uh, we measure the brightness of the star, and we just wait for that drop in brightness. And we wait for a repeating drop in brightness. So one of the reasons why the transit method is so successful is because of a mission called the Kepler spacecraft. How many people here have heard of the Kepler spacecraft? That's fantastic. Um, so Kepler was in space for about 10 years, but actually its primary mission, which gave us all the data we worked with in this project, uh, was only going on for about four years. And so th during this time, Kepler stared at one position in the sky for four years and looked at about half a million stars and measured the brightness of those stars every 30 minutes and was just waiting for these drops in brightness. And because of, uh, through this method, Kepler was able to discover over uh, 2,500 uh, exoplanets. Um, so this is pretty amazing. This completely revolutionized the field of exoplanet science um, and brought us to where we are today. Um, but Kepler data isn't pretty. So you know everything I just showed you is wonderful plots. It looks great. Um, that's not like what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So the top plot here um, is what we call a light curve. So this is a particular star that Kepler looked at and the brightness that was measured every 30 minutes for about 750 days. And you see all this stuff. You see this you know, ramping up. You see these drops in brightness. So some of that is spacecraft systematics, some of it's instrument noise, um, some of it's actual stellar variability. And only these little bitty drops that are highlighted by the red triangles are the exoplanet transit. Um, so this is one exoplanet. You see three transits uh, in this particular time period. And so we do a bunch of stuff to uh, flatten these light curves. So on the bottom panel is you see a flattened light curve. So it's been cleaned of all these systematics, stellar variability, and all you see are the transits. Um, but this is actually pretty nice data. It gets a lot worse than this, um, and particularly when you have more than one planet. So this is a now famous planetary system called the TRAPPIST system. And you see when you have multiple planets going around, you, you start getting overlapping transits. It's very hard to sort of tease all this out. So it's hard to work with this data and find these exoplanets. Um, another reason why it's hard to find these exoplanets is because there's a variety of false positive signals that mimic exoplanet transits, and we need to find these and vet them out. So one of the uh, main sources of false positives are exo or, sorry, uh, eclipsing binaries. So here you don't have a planet orbiting a star. You actually have two stars orbiting each other. One is usually smaller than the other. Um, and so you can get things that look a lot like an exoplanet transit. A particular nasty case are these background eclipsing binaries. So your target star is actually a single star, but there's an eclipsing binary in the background that you can't resolve. And that can actually look a lot like an exoplanet transit. And then there are chance alignments of stellar variability, instrument noise. You know, like the example that I showed before, there were three transits. And you can imagine that in some cases, you get chance alignment of three things that look like they're on a periodic uh, cadence. Um, and so you get. Uh, these false positives that way, and that becomes a problem when you dig into the lowest signal-to-noise transits, which unfortunately usually correspond to the most interesting cases of things like Earth-like planets in the habitable zones around sun-like stars, which was the whole point of Kepler. So you have to vet for all these false positives. So the way we do this, um, the Kepler team developed this very sophisticated pipeline, and I'll go through this very quickly, um, but this is sort of how we traditionally find exoplanet transits. So we start off with what are called target pixel files. These are little postage stamp images of stars. This is what's actually downloaded from the spacecraft. 
Then we use what we call aperture photometry. So you put down an aperture, you sum all the light within that aperture, and that's how bright the star is. You do that as a function of time, and you get those light curves that I showed you before that have all this systematics in it. You flatten those. Then you do an exoplanet transit search. So you start looking for these transits, and you record everything above a certain signal-to-noise threshold. You pass that through a data validation stage. So this is just you start fitting transit models, you start calculating statistics that can help you identify false positives. Um, and this is an iterative process. So you find one transit, you block out the light curve, you send it back into the tra transit planet search. Um, because as we know from our solar system, uh, stars can host many planets. Then when you're done, you feed all of this to a set of humans. Humans sit down. These are people's jobs, which is kind of cool. Their job is to just find exoplanets. Um, so they sit around, and they look at you know, hundreds of thousands of these transit events, um, and they figure out which ones are real exoplanets and which are not. And this is a very time-consuming process. You're sifting through a lot of data. It took years in the case of Kepler. But at the end of the day, we get these wonderful exoplanet catalogs, and we can start answering questions like, how common is our Earth in the galaxy? But this last part, this last very time-consuming part, is where deep learning um, can help and where it already is helping. Um, and today I'm going to tell you about how we did that. So now I'll move on to the deep learning side of what we did, and in particular how uh, Google Cloud helped us do this. Um, so I'm going to give you a 30-second introduction to deep learning for people who aren't too familiar about it. So deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Um, it's called deep learning because it uses a series of computational layers to basically take inputs, translate them into more useful outputs by learning increasingly complex features in the data. Neural networks are a type of deep learning. They're called neural networks because their architecture sort of is loosely analogous to the neurons in our brain. And then convolutional neural nets are a type of neural network that takes advantage of spatial features in the data. And they're particularly good at classification problems, which is essentially what we're doing. We're saying, is this a planet or is this not a planet? So the reason why we want to use deep learning for exoplanet transit science, um, there's a bunch of them. So one, it's quick. You train a model, and then you can classify hundreds of thousands of candidate uh, tra uh, planet transits within seconds instead of years. Um, it's systematic. So this human vetting that I talked to you about, you know, it's full of biases that you can't tease out. So I didn't have coffee this morning. I saw an eclipsing binary the last time I tried to vet a candidate. Um, I've seen planets the last 10 times I've looked at planets. Like All of this stuff biases your decision-making process, and it's really hard to tease out those biases and correct for them. And so having a systematic way of doing this is really important, um, and it's important for calculating all these exoplanet statistics that we're interested in. As we'll see from this presentation, there's also easy to upgrade these models. So you want to improve your model. It's easy to retrain and apply to new data. Um, and it's quantifiable. So you're not just saying, this is an exoplanet, this is not an exoplanet. You're saying, this is an exoplanet with 0.8 plus or minus 0.1 probability. And again, you can fold that into these exoplanet statistics and make them a lot more robust. So the first people to actually um, apply deep learning to exoplanet transit classification was Shalou and Vandenberg 2018. So Chris Shalou works at Google Brain. Uh, Andrew Vandenberg is a postdoc in astrophysics, like myself. And they made a model called Astronet. It's available on GitHub if you want to download it and play with the model. The model architecture is shown on the right. But basically, it's a deep convolutional neural network. It was written in TensorFlow. And the inputs are these global and local views of the phase-folded candidate transit. So what I mean by phase-folded is that I showed you these light curves before that span you know, four years. But there's a signal in there that's periodic. So you can fold the light curve on that period, and you get these nice uh, exoplanet transits that are shown on the bottom here. So they input these global and local views. The global view is uh, important because it shows you the whole transit. So in the case of these eclipsing binaries that I told you about, when there are two stars eclipsing each other, you actually get a primary and a secondary eclipse. So you get an eclipse when the, star, when the smaller star goes in front of the bigger star and also when it goes behind. And that's because you have, you're dealing with two very bright objects. You don't see that with a planet because the planet is small and it doesn't have its own brightness to it. So that's important for identifying things like eclipsing binaries. The local view zooms in on the transit and maps out its shape in more detail. And this is important because uh, true planet transits actually have a pretty unique shape. They kind of have a box-like shape. That's actually one of the ways that we, um, we can detect them. And that's just because the planet is so small compared to the host star. So both of these are important. Um, they're fed in uh, as separate disjoint one-dimensional one convolutional columns um, into the model. The outputs of the convolutional columns are flattened and concatenated, then fed through a series of fully connected layers, and then a sigmoid layer. And the output is this number between 0 and 1, which loosely represents the likeliness um, of that particular transit being associated with a, with a true exoplanet. 
So Astronet did something really cool, discovered two new super-Earths um, in two different systems. Uh, super-Earths are really cool because we don't have them in our solar system. So if you imagine our solar system, which is shown on the bottom here, we have the rocky planets in the in the in our solar system, and then we have the big gassy ice giants on the outer solar system and nothing in between. So super-Earths are cool because we don't have them in our own solar system. They're also really cool because it turns out, what we know from Kepler now, is that they're by far the most common type of planet in the galaxy. Um, so they're important, and we need to learn about them. So the Kepler-90 system um, was also a sun-like star, so it was a super-Earth around a sun-like star. And it brought that system, it uh, brought it up to uh, eight planets in the system. So it's actually the system in our galaxy with the most known exoplanets, and it brings it up to a tie uh, with our own solar system. So what we did over the summer through FDL uh, was to upgrade Astronet with uh, what we call added scientific domain knowledge. So it's just information that us scientists had that could improve the model performance. And it ended up improving it for, in particular, the low signal-to-noise transits that correspond to Earth-sized planets. And we called our model Exonet, and it's also available on GitLab if you want to check the model out. The updated architecture is on the right. Uh, but what I wanted to do before I get into the science side of it was just highlight um, the role of Google Cloud. So Google Cloud uh, was really sort of the glue that held the whole project together. So through it, we could make our code in Python through a collaborative environment of the Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, we called on PyTorch and Scikit-learn to build and test and train our models. Um, and the whole thing was incredibly seamless. Um, and you know, as someone, I walked into the FDL program with no machine learning experience, very little collaborative coding experience. And Google Cloud made the whole thing incredibly easy to learn and to pick up. Um, each of our team members had custom in instances. We had our own virtual machines. Um, so we could sort of customize uh, these machines to whatever we happened to be doing at that moment, whether it was building the model or training it or testing it. We had access to you know, amazing GPU resources. Um, and we used a persistent solid state drive uh, for reading our data quickly for training. Um, and so again, I just want to you know, highlight, as an academic, this was absolutely amazing. Um, let me give you some insight into how it works in academia. So we typically apply for a grant uh, to NASA or, or the National Science Foundation. And sometimes those grants let us buy hardware. And so we say we want to buy this hardware. It's usually not V100s, because then we would not get the grant approved. Um, but you get some money for hardware if you're lucky enough, and then you go off and you buy that hardware. Um, and then you use that hardware for on the order of five to 10 years, sometimes longer. Um, and then you get another grant, and the whole process starts over again. So it's very uh, slow, and so our resources are not just limited, but they're out of date. Um, so to have the resources that are provided by Google Cloud um, was, was pretty amazing. OK, so what did we add to our model to increase the model performance? So one of the things we added uh, first was a centroid time series. So I showed the light curves before, which is just how bright the star is as a function of time. The other thing you get from this data, so I mentioned before, what we actually get from the spacecraft are these posted stamp images. So you can lay down an aperture and measure the brightness within that aperture, but you can also measure the pixel position of the center of light within that aperture. And that's called the centroid. And you get that as a function of time. So in this case, let's say you have a background eclipsing binary. When that eclipse happens on that background source, the centroid will actually shift. It'll shift away from that binary. And you can use that information to identify false positives. Um, so this is what I mean. Um, so again, these global and local views of the, of the phase-folded uh, transit. On the top is a real exoplanet. So you see the transit, but you don't see a shift in the centroid, which is shown in red. Um, on the bottom is a background eclipsing binary. And you can see in the transit, you get the shift in the centroid. So you can take advantage of that information. And so the way we did that was to create secondary channels in the convolutional columns um, and to feed in the centroid time series along with the light curve. The other thing we did was add stellar properties. So one thing I didn't mention is that with this transit method, the planet properties you get out actually heavily depend on the properties of the host star. Um, so one of the things we did was uh, tell the model the properties of that particular host star. And there's a variety of reasons why this might help, but I'm showing one of them here. So here you have a giant star. Uh, being orbited by a main sequence star. And I'll explain what that means. So if you have a binary system, and by the way, half the stars in our galaxy are binary systems. So our sun is single, but actually 50% of the stars in the galaxy are binary. So this is an important effect. Um, when you have a binary system, they don't evolve at the same rate. They don't age at the same rate. Usually one ages quicker than the other. And when that happens, the star blows up um, and becomes a giant star. We call it a giant star because we have no imagination. But it gets really puffy. Um, our sun is going to do that. And when it does that, it'll actually engulf the Earth. Um, so that's how big these things are getting. 
But you can see the size difference is actually really similar to a, to a star and a planet. So you can get exoplanet transits, um, or things that look like exoplanet transits, when really it's, a, it's just an old star with a, with a middle-aged star orbiting it. So we fed in the stellar parameters. Um, we concatenated them to the outputs of the convolutional columns before the fully connected layers. And that's how we took advantage of that information. So we were able to increase the model performance um, over the baseline astronet by a few percent. Um, astronet was already performing really well, so that uh, increase of just a few percent um, actually corresponded to about 50% decreases in model error. Um, and there's a precision recall curve shown on the right that shows you that the centroids actually provided the best uh, boost to the model performance, but um, the stellar properties also helped. Um, what was interesting, though, is not just the overall model performance, but it turns out that we were getting a much better recall, almost 20% higher gains in, in recall for exoplanets that corresponded to, uh, that had the lowest transit signal to noise ratio, and these correspond to Earth sized planets. So what it's telling us is that our model exonet might be able to find uh, Earth-sized planets still lurking in the Kepler data, and that's what we're working on right now. OK, so at the end of the day, we were able to show that scientific domain knowledge improves exoplanet transit classification with deep learning, and all the scientists let out a big sigh that their jobs are not being taken by the machines <laughs> just yet. Probably soon, though. OK. So that was the exoplanet challenge, and now I'll spend some time talking about the astrobiology challenge. Um, my colleague Molly O'Byrne was supposed to be here, but unfortunately she couldn't make it, so I'm going to do the best I can um, to share with you their work. So this is the astrobiology team from last year. So Molly O'Byrne and Michael Himes were the planetary scientists, and Frank Zobozeski and Simone Zarzan were the planetary scientists, or sorry, were the computer scientists. Um, they also had wonderful mentors on the science and machine learning side, and of course Google Cloud uh, was the um, was the partner, was the industry partner. Okay, are we alone? That's a question that's been asked for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Um, and what's really exciting is that we're actually at a time when we might be able to answer this question. In the near future, we might be able to detect signatures of life on another planet. So the first step is finding those other planets, and as I just showed you, we're getting pretty good at that. But the next step after that is to figure out which one of those planets is most suitable for life, and therefore where we should look for life, where's the most likely place that we can detect life. Um, and that's, that's the hard part, that's still pretty hard. So the challenge for the astrobiology team was to use machine learning to try and identify possible extraterrestrial life on other worlds. Sounds pretty easy, right? But they did have a starting point. So what scientists uh, think they want to do is to look at the atmospheres of exoplanets, and in particular to look for molecules or groups of molecules in those atmospheres um, that are indicative of biological activity on the surface of those planets. And so those are collectively called biosignatures. Um, and we can actually do this. We can detect molecules in the atmospheres of exoplanets, um, but only for these hot Jupiters, so very massive planets very close to their star. And the way we do this is uh, we get a spectrum. So we use telescopes in space to get a spectrum um, of the atmosphere, and that spectrum has fingerprints of these molecules. And we use something called atmospheric retrieval to infer the actual composition of that atmosphere from that spectrum. The problem is that atmospheric retrieval, um, the traditional way of doing it, is incredibly, uh, in, it's incredibly time consuming. So it takes days, if not weeks, on supercomputers to actually back out atmospheric uh, composition from a spectrum. Um, so this is where machine learning, a uh, different approach, can, can speed this up. So the astrobiology team created a code called INARA. It stands for the Intelligent Exoplanet Atmospheric Retrieval. So INARA is really cool. It's an all-in-one flexible open source tool. So it starts by generating planetary spectra using NASA's Planetary Spectrum Generator, or PSG. So the reason why the astrobiology had to generate its data, as what I just mentioned. We can only measure exoplanet atmospheres for these hot Jupiters. Um, for Earth-like planets, it's much more difficult. We're not quite there yet, but there are plans for spacecraft in the future to be able to do this. And so this is very important precursor work. And so what the NASA's planetary spectrum generator does is uh, it'll produce a th synthetic spectrum based on certain spacecraft um, configurations um, and a given planetary atmosphere. So they created these spectra. Um, they can be saved locally or to a Google Cloud bucket. And then there's other um, in our instances that can pull that data out and then on the fly train and validate and test a machine learning model um, and to predict these planetary atmospheres. And this is available as a Python package or a Docker container. 
And the astrobi astrobiology team created 3 million of these simulated rocky exoplanet spectra. Um, and these are different combinations of about 28 planetary and stellar properties. And it output 12 atmospheric models, including these biosignatures. So this is like by far the largest library of exoplanet spectra there is available, and it's all publicly available. So this is more of a visual, visual way of what I just said. So this is the Inara Google Cloud Platform landscape. So there, there was the data generation size, and again, 3 million unique spectra, and they used 2,000 Google Cloud uh, virtual machines to do this. So the way it was uh, laid out is that there were these uh, virtual machine nodes that had the NASA PSG tool on them, and then 16 Anara Docker instances were connected to each of those nodes, querying the PSG to make spectra, and then those instances were saving the spectra to a Google Cloud bucket. And then there were separate Anara machine learning training instances that were connected to that Google Cloud bucket, actively reading those out and training the models on the fly. And the astrobiology team did a grid search of 70 model architectures, um, primarily written in uh, PyTorch, but they also explored different uh, frameworks using Keras and TensorFlow. Um, and what's also cool about this is that uh, if you had a project that was sort of similar to this, you can take this framework and just input your own spectrum generator or what generator of whatever, um, and then input your own machine learning model. And so this whole framework is set up, and you can actually just plug and play whatever you need for your, for your science needs. So this is the model architecture they decided on. In the, uh, in the end, it's actually quite similar to the exoplanet one. It's a one-dimensional a series of one-dimensional convolutional uh, layers with max pooling, um, which were then fed through some fully connected layers at the end. So this is a result from just a random planet from, from their sample, only for five molecules. Um, so it's a bit hard to see, but there are some red stars that are the true value of that planetary atmosphere. Um, and then you, the sort of colorful blobs are the uh, predictions from the model. Um, and you're getting a distribution, because this was actually a Bayesian deep learning uh, model that took advantage of, of concrete dropout to create these posterior distributions. So you can, say, you can see it does pretty well um, for these molecules. Um, but it actually predicts 12 molecules. This is much more than, than other planetary retrieval methods. Um, and of course, the big benefit is that you know, this is created in seconds, whereas previously, atmospheric retrieval requires days um, to do the same thing. All right, so in the end, the astrobiology team generated uh, 3 million uh, rocky exoplanet spectra and developed um, its first machine, le machine learning um, atmospheric retrieval model for rocky terrestrial exoplanets um, like the Earth. So this is pretty, pretty amazing. And it's all publicly available if you wanted to play around with it. OK, so um, that's all I had for you now. Um, I, I've had a great time sharing with you. I hope you had a great time learning about some of the cool science that can be done through the Google Cloud Platform. Um, and I just want to finish by saying, like, this was an amazing experience for me to go through this program. Again, I had zero machine learning experience going into this, and the tools that are available through the Google Cloud platform made it not just easy to learn, but also enjoyable and fun to learn. So I'm very excited to see all the future science that can come out of collaborations uh, with the Google Cloud platform. Thank you very much.